Hey fam, before we get started, just to let you know that this is part of a race and racism in the South African media series of four parts. This is episode three of four parts. So check the link to the playlist below for the other episodes in this series. And this series is also brought to you by the South African Media Innovation Program, SAMIP, which is a multi-year digital disruption initiative aimed at supporting South African digital media innovators. So if you're someone who's interested in innovating in the media, if you think that SMWX has been doing some cool stuff and you might be able to do similar stuff, make sure you also check out SAMIP's website in the description below and you might benefit from the great work that they're doing. So without any further ado, let's get on to our episode with the brilliant and the inimitable journalist, Samkele Maseko. Aye, aye. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today we are joined by uh, an incredible well-renowned journalist, uh, despite his relative youth, risen to be one of our country's most formidable and important political journalists now at the SABC and has held various posts in various places before that. Samkele Maseko, bro, thanks for joining us on SMWX. Thank you very much, Sizwe, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity and uh, grateful to be on this platform. And uh, I consider myself as one of the few that are blessed uh, to share such an uh, auspicious uh, occasion with you <laughs> no it's, it's really great it's really great to have you and you know as part of the series we're talking about race in the media a uh, conversation that's long overdue and i wanted to kick it off by asking you about some of your personal experiences you know you've seen many different newsrooms you've been in some of the most prominent places in the news media in south africa can you share with us how how race has affected your experiences as a practitioner as a journalist in our country? Race within the media landscape is unfortunately something that is not largely spoken about in this country. I've experienced it in various media organizations that I've worked in in my short career. And I'd say mm. that it's something that affects many young journalists negatively. I know of an incident in one media organization where I almost slipped into depression. I was so unhappy of uh, the racial inequalities that were being perpetuated in the newsroom. At some point, that media organization, there was a clear split in the, in, in the newsroom that you had a black caucus of young journalists and managers in one WhatsApp group and others in another so-called WhatsApp group where it consisted of those who were white. And eventually that came out to the fore that there was this particular WhatsApp group that uh, all predominantly African journalists who were part of in that media organization and it tore that newsroom down the middle we had to have wow. a bosphora the heart to heart and speak about uh, the racial segregation that's there in that uh, media house and uh, i'd say that uh, my then manager played a very important and pivotal role in bringing about and speaking about the social cohesion that we mm. need to work together regardless of our racial class and the economic status that you are in. But uh, that racial segregation also spoke to the economic disparages of uh, salaries that are there within Media House that you'd find hmm. that your white counterpart earns twice as much as you earn despite you doing thrice the work that they do. So this issue of racism within the media sector is very prevalent and it's prevalent in most uh, media organizations and not just those whom we may perceive to be the glamorous media organizations, but it also speaks to the economic inequalities that are there in our, in our country between mm. whites and uh, the black community. Wow, Samkele, that's, <laughs> that's, those are some incredible revelations. You know, we see, you, we see you on our screens, we see you covering these important stories, but actually there, there are all these dynamics that we don't see that are going on in newsrooms behind the scenes. Um, you know, and journalists have to work under these conditions and deliver in a very high pressure environment. The unfortunate part is that uh, most journalists, uh, for instance, they must be that push in your stomach that drives mm. you to succeed. And I've found that uh, in most uh, newsrooms nowadays, that is seemingly dying because of the racial mm. divisions that are there in our, in, in our newsrooms, but that also translates from what is there 
within the society in our country, the racial divisions that are there, the tensions that are there. We look mm. at what's happening currently in Senegal and uh, those white mm. farmers and how they were basically damaging state property and setting a police van alight. But uh, you never saw the police, uh, the SAPS, uh, Peggy Taylor with his hat going down there with rubber bullets, with stun grenades, mm. and, uh, and arresting those white farmers. But if that were to happen in a township, you'd imagine what uh, those uh, people in that specific township would be going through with rubber bullets flying left, right, and center. You look at what happened to the artists mm. in Durban when they were protesting and how the municipality would throw the metro police in Etewini fired rubber bullets at those protesters. But you look at and compare it to Senegal, nothing mm. of that happened. You look at uh, some of the issues that have been raised within the media domain by people like, uh, make no mistake, I don't want to get into the politics of them, your Pete sure, Rampedis, sure. your Paramele Shubis at ENCA, yeah, yeah. You know, Colin Gambis uh, as well there. You look at mm, other media organizations mm. and some of the stories that have come up. You look at how uh, Joanne Joseph uh, just recently left uh, 702 uh, and uh, Yusebis Makaiza. And it brings about the question of this racial divisions that are there within media organizations. And some of these uh, divisions that are perpetuated in these media houses are also perpetuated and strongly enforced by white males females, but sadly, even black managers, you find mm. them oppressing their own people of color in these media organizations. One of my friends referred to black managers in this country as basically butlers and maids within these media organizations, and they're just managers at face value, rather than being actual managers as opposed to their white counterparts. You know, so much of what you're saying is a revelation because for those of us outside these media houses, you know, you have you have an inkling that maybe something's going on, but but to actually hear it confirmed from a respected figure who actually is paid to tell the truth, is uh, is quite something. And you know what you said about the Senegal question is is really interesting, and it's something I want to focus on, not only because of the way that the you know the farmers who gathered in this town, you know, for those who, who don't know what's happening in Senegal, it's a town in the Free State where there've been protests over. Uh, the murder of, of a farmer, Brendan Horner. Um, and, and by the way, you know, I, I don't think any of us wishes gratuitous violence on, on anyone. And, and I think what, what obviously happened to this farmer is, 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 is terrible. Um, at the same time, if we're going to have a discussion about life in South Africa or on South African farms, we have to have a discussion about the history of land dispossession. We have to have a discussion about, you know, the conditions of workers on farms. Um, but that's one thing. There's another thing which is about how it has been framed. And again, it's been a textbook case of the way that race affects media because yes, I've seen some, some publications changing their tune, but when it started, it was all about, you know, these people weren't called thugs. They weren't called dangerous. Um, they were, you know, it was all about what's their mental state. You know, they were angry, they were frustrated as if protesters aren't always angry. And it's almost as if they were being humanized in many of our publications in ways that black protesters don't get to be humanized. You know, no one ever says, oh, you know, these protesters must have been angry. Let's understand why they were doing it. They just get called thugs and looters, you know? So I think in many of the ways that we frame these questions, Senegal has shown us the problem that we have in our media. Senegal was a classic example of how, race, of how racialized reporting has become in this country. If I were to go report on a, on a protest in Santin, as opposed to a protest in Alexandra, that would be totally different. You mm. go to what recently happened in KwaZulu Natal. I remember mm. this gentleman saying, Do you know the atrocities that black farmers, black workers within the farming industry face in this country? Mm. People are, farmers shoot black people and say, mistaken, they were shooting a monkey. Mm. And there's no outrage. You go to Seneca, you look at the atrocities that black people face in these farms. I'm not saying farmers are not being killed, but you must also have a debate equally on how black people are at the receiving end of poverty, deprivation, unemployment, inequality. You look at the dwellings that farm workers stay in. I'm from largely from a farming area in Applesport in Guazulu Natal, Emma mm. I can tell you now, 
my forebears worked at Maplazi. Mm. In fact, Umkulu Umkulu Kofenene still stays there. The poverty that they're subjected to at the hands of farm owners in their own homeland, on their own land. Mm. But you've seen the demands from these farmers, especially when it comes to the issues of Section 25 of the Constitution. It speaks to how also the media landscape, the reporter is so racialized. Mm. Us black reporters who are seemingly from a black consciousness orientation are pushing a certain narrative when it comes to the issues of black South Africans in the country. Then mm. on the other side, our white counterparts are pushing a narrative that seeks to cushion the economic landscape, cushion those who are in the commanding heights of the economy, but it all boils down to one thing. The newsroom is racially divided, just like how society is also racially divided. So you can't separate the mm. two, which also brings about one of the most important and pivotal questions, which has become somewhat of a subdued debate in the country, the ownership of media organizations. Mm. You know, mm. when Tabile Nguato and Chogodani came up with Newsroom Africa, leave yeah. the politics behind it, leave whatever is being said, but it was two young black media mochals coming up, starting mm. something that you and I may not and may never have the financial power to compete in with well-established media organizations that may yeah. have some percentage from well-established conglomerate companies that also have an international footprint that may not compete with them. So you also look at how Power FM has gradually and slowly and penetrated that uh, commercial stream within the radio sector competing with 702. You look at how 702 has dropped listeners over the years. You look at the various comparisons of the reportage of media organizations, and you also come with the similarities that are there and the, the racial divisions that are also being perpetuated by us journalists, consciously or subconsciously. And mm -hmm. that can only come back to societal issues that are there and the racial divisions that are there in the country. You go to a media organization today, Samke Masego will drive in with Apollo, with Apollo Vivo, permanent arm struggle as one political leader would say, <laughs> but my white counterpart will drive mm. in with a BMW, with mm. a Mercedes Benz, with mm. a luxurious vehicle, with a paid up apartment. I still have to rent a gas in Alex, mm. in Tembisa, in Ivory Park, in Olivens mm. Bosch, yet I'm the face of a media organization. How does that work? Sure. You know, this question of, of payment is such an important one because, you know, one of the things I, I was struck by last year when I started covering the election and becoming kind of closer to the media world in South Africa, you start to realize, wow, journalists, mm -hmm. journalists are, are just as flashy as the, politi the politicians <laughs> they criticize. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? Who, who's who here? Like, on the one hand, we're saying, no, these politicians must stop with all this flashy stuff. You turn around, the journalist is driving a nicer car than the politician. And people don't know this because there isn't as much scrutiny, funnily enough, on journalists. And, and when, when you talk about inequality of payment, that's a crucial battleground, surely, in, in newspapers and digital publications. How can it still be that black journalists doing equal, if not more work, are not being remunerated like their white counterparts? It boils down to one thing. When you apply for a job, I come from a disadvantaged footprint. I come from an environment where I had no assistance. I may have not had a prior in, uh, employment. Mm. It's easier. Let's just be broad and be frank. Sure. Nowadays, when it comes to the issues of employment, most media organizations, they may advertise, but they hit hunt. I may be fortunate. I'm one of the fortunate ones to have received numerous increases. I'll be honest. Mm. I'm relatively paid okay. Not well. Okay. So you're telling me that but Polo someone... has now, you know... <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a bit of cheese. Let me say it like that. But all I'm saying is that Mm. Someone who does the same job as some Kele may not be as fortunate as some Kele to have received the same prominence which I have received. Sure. Yes, they will, they may, we may put in the same amount, the same effort, but I may have a broader network than that particular individual. That mm. individual then suffers because they don't have the same network as me. 
for our white counterparts, it becomes easier for them to navigate around these media organizations because they may know someone who knew someone, worked with a certain uncle somewhere, a certain mm. cousin somewhere, and it becomes easier for them to navigate the system of the media organization. But for sure. someone who's studying currently at Tony University of Technology and wants to break into mainstream media as a political journalist, it te it's 10 times more difficult for that individual as opposed to a white person or white mm. uh, fellow journalist within this industry. I've seen it. I've been through various internships, struggled with many of our other colleagues to get our next gig until the infamous ANN7 gave us an opportunity. Leave the politics behind it. Mm. But the mo most young black journalists that you see now within these mainstream media organizations, you would find that 60 to 70% of them have a history with the defunct, the defamed, and infamous ANN7 or Afro sure. World View, formerly owned by Jimmy Man. Mm. I'm not advocating for them. Sure. All I'm just saying is a platform was provided for young journalists to break into the industry, mm. to be noticed by your Jacaranda FMs, news, to be noticed by your ENCAs, to be noticed by your 702s, to be noticed by your SABCs. And that platform, in a sense, has given them something in the pocket in order to be able to sustain themselves. Mm. But they also have to go back home and contribute in what many black people face, which is black tax. Mm. Our, our white counterparts, on the other hand, the vast majority of them don't have black tax. They've already got assets to their names from their parents and they are well off. Not all of them. Not all of them. But the issue of the economic inequalities in our countries, in our country, is also very prevalent in news organizations. And this is, this is a debate that we as young black journalists and white journalists, not to exclude them, because we are one at yeah. the end of the day, in order if we are to get over this racial segregation that's there in our country. We need to have these formal debates with politicians because if they say there's economic dis uh, or financial discrepancies in salary scales in the country, we also as journalists have to speak out. I know of many instances mm. where journalists have been oppressed in the workplace, but they go and report on labor issues. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. You look at what happened at ANN7. You work 12 to 15 hours a day. You get paid mm. peanuts. You don't have leave days. You are exploited. The company doesn't even, hasn't even signed up with UIF, yet they deduct your UIF monies. Those are the issues that are there in the media landscape. And it's issues that we young journalists don't speak about. One of the few journalists who has the guts and stands up and speak about these issues is Tato, Tato rather, from uh, EWN702, who has also been within the trade union, spa trade union space and was a mm. spokesperson of pop crew. You look at how journalists are ununionized. I don't even speak about the Communication Workers Union, please. Don't even. <laughs> mm. I don't know the other union. I'm not a member of the union. But all I'm just saying, journalists are exploited in this country because once they are ununionized, unions themselves have become weak. You look at uh, the worker exploitation that's currently going on in the country, which also speaks to the racial segregation, because if unions are not strong, it basically means that workers are exploited. The racial segregation, the racial economic segregation in, this, uh, in these companies, not only in media organizations, everywhere. You go to, to banks, yeah. tellers who are black rock up in Polo, their counterparts rock up in luxurious SUVs, stay in luxurious apartments, they stay go gas. Mm. But what does it all boil down to, Caesar? The economic and racial segregation that is there in the country. Yes, some journalists are flashy. It's not wrong to be a lover of things in life. It's not wrong. If I, if I loved Louis, Louis Vuitton and Gucci and I could afford it, I'd wear it. It's unfortunate that I don't have a love for those things. But there are other journalists who have that love for those things. And if they legally acquire those assets, it's nothing wrong for them. The problem is that most of us within the political journalism space have assumed political ambitions, would see ourselves as politicians. You look at the various divisions and reportage that's there. You look at how journalists have chosen factions within political formations, whether it be the EFF, 
the IFP, the Democratic Alliance, the African National Congress. A classic example is this mm. issue of Ace Makashule being arrested, a warrant of arrest of Ace Makashule. Yeah. You clearly saw the division that are there within the media, media landscape. Mm. You go to the various Sunday publications, you take City Press, you take uh, The Independent, you take uh, Sunday Times, you will clearly see the political divisions that are there that are being pushed by who? Seemingly the owners of media organizations and the type of influence they want to have over politicians and the politics of the day. Because the reality is media organizations it essentially influence the perceptions and the political trajectory of the country. And if you control a media organization, you control the narrative in the country. You know, I wanted to ask you about that because I think you're in a, a really interesting position having you know, worked in major private media uh, corporations and, and institutions, but now also working at the SABC where as opposed to some of these institutions, firstly, you probably have greater black representation and then the ownership structure is somewhat different. So the incentives are different, but that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you work in the SABC, uh, race doesn't affect the way that you experience your job. So I wondered, as opposed to working in the private media, what's it like to work in, in, in public owned media? Um, obviously, you know, I don't expect you to try and throw your employer under the bus, but just what are the kind of tensions? <laughs> What are the tensions that a black journalist feels? You know, should I go to the SABC? Should I not? You know, how can you help the next generation of journalists try to navigate those tensions? When I was outside the SABC, mm. I had this fear that there is influence by politicians too much on the, on the South African Broadcasting Corporation, especially mm. the newsroom at the SABC. Mm. I had that fear. So one of the reasons why I... At first, I was a bit reluctant to even negotiate with the SABC. Well, my, my, issue, my negotiations with the SABC probably started two years ago before I mm. even joined. Mm. Uh, but I would say the SABC is a public broadcaster. Every politician or political formation wants to have a say. And they do have a say because they are part of the electoral politics of the country. They have seats in parliament. They mm play an oversight role of the SABC. But I would say that in my tenure, since I've been there for the past 10 months, mm. I've not seen any direct influence by any political formation at the SABC. Any political formation. If I decide to go to Julius Malema today and tell Julius Malema, this is not your show, we will walk out if we have to walk out. There's no one at the SABC who rebuked me. Mm. If I, tell, if I ask Ace Mahashule if he's a corrupt politician, I'm not saying he is, or if Julius Malema benefited fraudulently and Floyd Chivambo from VBS, there's no one at the SABC to say to, say to me, some girl, don't ask those questions. The mm. same with the Democratic Alliance. And I would arguably say the general manager of news of the SABC, Patiswa Mahopen, has done an absolutely outstanding role in separating the newsroom cushioning the newsroom from any outside political influence. The political editor at the SABC, Mzandi Lamberge, the foreign uh, or international relations editor at the SABC, Sophie Mukwen, they've done, and the team, Nyana Njanji of General News, they've done an exceptional job in protecting the integrity, the independence, the impartiality of the newsroom. I don't want to speak about other media organizations, <laughs> you know what's there. Yeah. You know what's in the public domain. You know the issues that were raised in December. Mm. Are they still like that? Or is that specific media organization still like that? I don't know. Mm. Well, all I, I want to come. Know, yeah. All I know mm. is what's in the public domain. There are differences with whichever political formation. And it's only people who are inside there who can speak for what's currently happening there. I don't mm. know. But all I know is that in any media organization, any loving politician of themselves would want to influence the direction of that particular newsroom, mm. influence it so that it portrays their political formation in a positive light. All political formations do that. 
all political formations try and bully the media and media organizations. I can't spare any of them. And the sad part is some of the of political formations who portray themselves as champions of media freedom in this country are the mm. ones who silently want to bully journalists through their bosses. Hmm. And have you ever experienced that? Um, not, not to mention names or anything, but... but I've, I've mentioned, I've, I've been yeah. through it. Yeah. I know it. I've been through it and I've stood my ground. My bosses have stood their ground, mm. refused to apologize to certain powerful politicians and ministers who wanted mm. certain apologies for stories covered on them. And hmm. the boss just said, no, provide me with proof. If you are not satisfied, take us to the PCCSA. Mm. Still today, they've not. You know, Zangele, this, sorry, but just this, what you say interests me because um, on the one hand, you're known, you're known for, for being unapologetically anti, anti-racist. Um, but on the other hand, you're also known for, for asking tough questions of politicians. And that's not an easy balance to strike, you know, because maybe some politicians think, oh, you know, Samkele is unapologetically pro-black. Um, maybe I can get him on my side. Meanwhile, you actually ask him a tougher <laughs> question than, than any other journalist. <laughs> How do you strike that balance? Because it's an important one. We, we, we don't want racism in the media. We don't want the media to be racist about politicians, even if they are corrupt. Uh, we don't want to perpetuate racist stereotypes. But on the other hand, we don't want to allow a journalism that pretends to be anti-corruption, but is actually pursuing a racist agenda at the same time. You know, I was very fortunate to grow up in a political home. Had credentials in the struggle, that violence that happened between two political formations in the Midlands in the period of when I was born, 1990 to 94, I've always been politically conscientized from home. Mm. And one thing I learned was in life, when it's wrong, whether it's done by a white person or a black person, it's wrong. But as a young black man, come from a poor background. Those who represent the marginalized, the poor, the disenfranchised, you've got to hold them far more accountable than those of another skin color. Because the saddest part is when oppression is done by Masango to Masego, by Ngaezo, you can't, as a black government, oppress the black people you seek to liberate in the struggle against white oppression and think it's okay for you to steal from them, for you to loot their resources, for you to oppress them economically so that they perpetually carry on voting for you, for you to continue with the legacy of apartheid of creating generational poverty for black people. That you can't. You must hold them far more accountable than the apartheid government was held to, be, to, to account. Because they know what oppression did to them. So why allow them to do that oppression to black people? You may, they may well think, or have that view that oh, you are pro-black, you are going to be pushing their agenda. No. If you as the ANC, as the EFF, as the IFP, as the Democratic Alliance, as the Freedom Front Plus do wrong, you will be held accountable just like everybody else. But if you say you are hailing from the struggle, you fought for the liberation of this country and you oppress black people and you think just because we may have the same ideological inclination that I'm going to be soft in you, Oh boy, have you got something coming for you. That's where you strike the balance. And I owe no political allegiance to anyone, to any political formation. I do vote. Trust me, in every election I've voted since I was an eligible voter. 
But the most important thing as a journalist that I learned, you need to hold everybody accountable, have no favorites. You, I, I've got friends who are in political formations, who are leaders in youth formations, leaders in political organizations. I sit, I have a drink with them, I cry with them, chat about politics. But once I'm at work, that friendship is put aside. Once you put on that cap as a politician, put your friendship and your close proximity to me aside because I won't do any favors to you. Well, uh, Samkele, thanks so much for joining us on SMWX uh, from the ground, always at work. And uh, it was nice to be the one to ask you the questions this time. Thank you very much, your brother. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Keep doing the great work. Spread the fire, like, share, comment below, and let us know what you thought of this conversation. And keep watching SMWX. I hear you.